Hey guys, good morning. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful sleep uh, and hope you are feeling refreshed uh, for the day. Uh, but I think I'll keep the talk exciting for you on those things. I've been preparing for this. Uh, so uh, the talk is generally regarding like uh, about real-time communication, right? So in a conversation that we do offline, uh, so what is actually a real-time communication? So we'll just start from basic and then we'll build our grounds to the complexity of things that we are doing at Hurdle Rover to bring it to the life. Yeah, uh, so here you can see basically like me and Ayus are interacting in the real world. So in the real world, this real-time communication is basically you are transferring sound waves to each other and our brain is intercepting these things, right? Uh, but then how do we do this over internet? And if we do it over internet, what are the advantages that we have, right? Uh, so if we do over internet, we require some kind of devices, which is your uh, laptop or mobile because they have this phone and camera. So the advantage that you get is that basically you can now communicate cross continent and you don't have to be in the proximity of things that is required. And you can like uh, talk cross domain passively, actively the way that you require uh, on those things. But to do these things just for a peer to peer call, I would just talk about the technology that actually supports this P2P call. Uh, so there is a protocol called WebRTC protocol. Uh, so it's like a very legacy protocol that is used for peer-to-peer -peer communication, right? So as I have seen, right, for this uh, communication to carry out, you need some kind of devices, right? So how does this work on a very basic and primitive level? So you can see in this diagram, basically you have microphone, and your camera. So they basically capture, right? After capturing, what happens is basically the encoding of these data happens. After this encoding, basically they are made ready to be sent over the bandwidth uh, or on the over the internet. When it is sent over the internet, the receiving uh, person basically decodes this packet and then again play it to their screens and play it to their speaker. So this is the whole journey of the transfer of the packets that happens. But then you can basically enhance this with help of like web codecs or web transport and you can also have like a breakout box or even insertable streams, right? So with insertable streams here, you can bring end-to-end -end encryption over these calls. And with breakout box, you can basically have this data uh, generating data instead of your uh, camera or mic. So this is like you can have uh, virtual objects into this real world and you can do all kind of media processing uh, with these uh, methodologies. Uh, so on the other side of diagram is basically what is a WebRTC protocol, right? So WebRTC protocol is just like an OSI stack. It is basically bunch of collection of other protocols, right? So there is no standards. It's just that industry started to build on top of each other. And then some bunch of protocols started to refer to called it as WebRTC uh, on those things. But uh, again, uh, we'll just see how it more works like in the context. So this was this media processing that happens on the WebRTC. And uh, Huddle actually uses WebRTC protocol uh, to some extent to uh, do their calls uh, on that. So now here you can see like as I taken the example of Ayush and me, the problem in establishing a P2P call is called NAT. So they are the evil in this room, right? Uh, so how do we establish this call is basically, now you cannot, uh, to establish this call, you need to basically know the identity of that peer, but that identity get obfuscated because of the NAT. It is just the way internet was designed because of the IPv4 and IPv6. So people started to deploy signaling servers, right? That came into picture. So signaling server came to basically enhance the shortcomings of WebRTC protocol, right? And to, to overcome the NAT traversal problem, uh, there was turn servers and there is turn servers deployed. So as you can see in this diagram, once the uh, signaling is done, a P2P secure encrypted data channel is uh, constructed and then all the conversation can be carried out safely P2P and on browser based on those. So this is how your audio video call works in a very P2P fashion on those time. But uh, so, okay. So now we have figured out like what are the, how P2P works and how P2P uses some of the central components to basically establish a peer-to-peer -peer call. So this is the net traversals that we have. 
now this is now what we can what we can do is basically i have abstracted out all those things and denoting it as a p2p call right so this is again me and i use having a peer to peer call uh, on those regard now how do we scale this call right so i brought in yuan menet gabriel david dice i use and with me also so as you can see with my with this diagram right so uh, i use i use is having like three he needs to receive from the three and send from the three people right even like sushmit has to send from three people and send uh, and listen to three people so this does not scale so the p2p mesh network does not scale like if you introduce one more person then these channels would actually grow and we know that each person is actually bottlenecked by its bandwidth and computational resources so on that same bandwidth and computational resources you are basically increasing this connection so this won't scale with a p2p mesh network so what do we do so basically industry came up with a method called mcu right so what does mcu does so mcu does is like it takes all your audio video packets and then actually processes it it is that it does compute over it so it's very compute intensive but uh, the main advantage is that now you have to only maintain one link and one down link so it becomes scalable but it is very expensive in nature because server is doing some kind of computation on those side again uh, the pricing of this service based becomes very high a uh, transcoding becomes very inefficient here so we came with another method it is called sfu right so sfu basically stands for selective forward unit and it does not processes the packets is basically routes the packet so basically here what sfu is doing is like you can see it is routing each other's packet to each other right so you can see how we have minimized the downlink side and basically optimizing the bandwidth resources that we have and again all of those bandwidth can be more optimized with the uh, of the codecs and the simulcast to use into the calls so this is here i think zoom google meet everyone in the world uses this technology it's called sfu uh, but at huddle we have been working on this for like past 3 year so there is a lot of advancements that we have done into this tech and the way because for us catering to the experience is of at most level high level and then we like engineer our technology on top of it so i would be talking around on those things like how we actually process it and how we went forward uh, so this is our technical ar uh, architecture that we have so here you can see we have this bunch of orchestrators so they act like a brain for this architecture and then you have this media servers so these media servers are distributed in nature and these act like a muscle to this uh, giant organisms that we uh, have and there is huddle client so this huddle client basically gives this call request to this architecture and this architecture is load aware region aware and it is scalable to uh, on demand like it can scale on the traffic spike that it have now in the future like i would go into the each component like orchestra and uh, the media server how they actually operate and they work so you can see huddle client so like a uh, huddle client uh, is like a small uh, a small base that can like work in the browser itself in normal mobile and in normal laptop also right and orchestra is basically the brain that basically orchestrate uh, the whole architecture so that the call is efficiently progress so the main job of the orchestrator is like is basically to assign like which media server is the best to actually process the call uh, on those thing and it takes a uh, lot of consideration into that nature on those things and this is also actually you can see from the previous slide right uh, it, uh, okay uh, so uh, actually went to the next slide so next slide i was about media server so you can see what this media server does is that it basically is an sfu that we have written but we have basically made it very advanced in nature so what we are doing is basically at every cpu core there is a worker deployed right and on top of worker every worker actually has this uh, can deploy multiple routers and each router can do a single room right and a router can like handle 400 consumers on those run. so like um, n number so just we are just optimizing the number of core cpu that we can use and just scale that call out that makes it cheaper and it makes it much more faster but for the larger room we basically uh, deploy a single router uh, on single worker and then basically we can combine all the cpu core 
to cater to that large room. So large room like 1000 people, 2000 people can be basically processed in that manner. So, now, so our architecture is basically optimized for the small rooms also and our architecture is actually optimized for the large room also because the volume of small room is very high. Uh, but the volume of large room is not very high, but it is has this spike in nature that we need to cater to. And this comes from our experience and learning uh, while the product uses that we have at Huddle itself. So these are the main architectural advancements that we have. And we deploy a bunch of other algorithms that we have customly deployed to improve the user experience, uh, drive down the pricing and improve the scalability. And one of the best solution is something I want to show you diagrammatically in uh, nature and it will come in the upcoming slides. Uh, so actually I just talked about this, uh, how actually our infrastructure is working, how all the calls and everything is processed and it is at a very primitive level. I think uh, 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 going, we'll just go over this slide. I think it's very technical in nature on those things, but I just had a explanation of this thing. Yeah. So we have like a load balancer, simulcast, land stand, co uh, codec, multi-threading, SFU cascading to handle user at scale. And all of those things is authenticated and our recording goes on IPFS and Filecoin, right? So if you see uh, uh, a platform like Huddle produces a very large amount of data. Uh, so imagine like 10 people producing 720p of data uh, every 10 minutes on those things. So all these things is like a very valuable data uh, that can be directly dispersed to the Filecoin miners on those things. So this is where like it becomes a very good uh, tangent uh, to uh, for us to like have Filecoin and IPFS built into our architecture on those things. So cascading, right? So here you can see this is a very interesting scaling solutions that we have actually cracked. So here you can see there are two servers into this region, right? And uh, there are eight people having this call. So you can see the other four people have to travel, their audio video packets have to travel like a large distance. So the experience for these four people becomes very bad. But the experience for these four people become very good. And having making this cross-continental call experience way better, how do we actually design it, right? So we came up with a method called cascading and it's working live and it has like a proven to improve latency and performance also. So this is how cascading works. Yeah, so you can see these nodes basically intercommunicate with each other and now you can see how you have optimized the experience of all the people into the call itself. And these people can now have very good experience of this uh, meeting on those things. So basically these two nodes can cascade and they can like deliver a very high experience for the people who are actually using this service on those part. And uh, so this is the overall infrastructure that we have at Huddle. It is live, it is running, and you guys can use it out of the box in your App Store, Play Store, or on the browser itself. Uh, so this is the videos actually that I have the, showing the scalability of side of things. I think once if I have time, I would just show in my later trip, but like let, let me carry on with the other slides. Uh, so like we believe in progressive decentralization and this is why we had a product first approach. Since we had this product first approach, we can understand from the network effect and bootstrap our infrastructure with an intrinsic motivation. And in later like we can catalyze this intrinsic motivation with extrinsic factor, right? So here you can see like we have this atomic structure of business logic which is market driven, research driven and time iterative, right? In the next step, we would be adding lib P2P and physical device support. This makes it as a deep in infrastructure, which is uh, the cool native that is going on right now. And in the later stage, we will basically dock all this infrastructure with incentive mechanism and crypto economics and do a testnet launch. Mm -mm. Yeah, uh, so this is how actually our lib P2P nodes work. I think lib P2P is a super cool technology from the Filecoin and PL team and I'm like a great fan of it. And I think, so we are using this uh, DST and Calamida to basically 
bootstrap uh, test this node and make this network of node very resilient in nature and lip p2p provide us lot of primitives to help us to uh, do that so so here actually we have put down all the guidelines how we are actually uh, doing this to make that possible so we are using bootstrap and circuit relays to enable us to do uh, this make this network resilient on those lines and solve this discovery problem once discovery is solved everything becomes easy for us Yeah, so this is our resilience, like how we can like use even the circuit relay node as the bootstrap node. So this is like how we are optimizing this lip P2P network and this is like we are playing around lip P2P domain, experimenting with it like what more that we can explore. And by the way, all the Ethereum 2.0 and every most of the major protocol are built on top of lip P2P. Uh, so this is the whole protocol that it goes through. I think uh, we'll just skip through. Uh, if someone is interested, I'm happy to share the slides. Uh, on those things, uh, the crypto economics, right? So we are like we have talked about how we were making this business logic, how we are docking it on top of lip P2P, and how we are thinking about the lip P2P, right? So once you have this node into this picture, right? So they would be secured into this protocol by a staking subsystem, and there would be a huddle, uh, a token, right, which would act like a state of that economic system. So it would be used as a currency also, and it would be, it, it, it's basically a coordinating uh, tool for all of the stakeholders that are related into this RTC ecosystem. Uh, so these are the media nodes, right? The, the purpose of the media node would be to provide the real-time communication service uh, for the protocol for an, anyone to use. And the media nodes reward the way they would be re getting rewarded would be based on their availability, history of operation, quality of service, past service, and its location uh, to this, like so that we can assign people who are nearest to the node because it increases. Uh, so uh, let me compare with like how Huddle actually is in the Web2 world, right? So in the Web2 world, you can see there are uh, industries like Google, Zoom, Meet, and other industry, right? But you can see all of those system is basically top down. They are corporate owned and they are basically private good, which means their counterpart are actually competing with each other. So they are rivalrous and all of those things. I think there exists a design space where we can enhance all of those things. So we are making with Huddle this RTC ecosystem, community owned, uh, bottom up economy and this network becomes as a public good and it becomes non-rivalrous and non-excludable, which means like even Zoom can like run nodes into this ecosystem or use this protocol to power their Google Meet and all of those. So, so they just, this become this part and all of this. So all even uh, even normal individual can like become the nodes and provide and interact with this protocol itself. So you make this uh, network as open, neutral, borderless, decentralized, and censorship resistant, uh, the ethos of the Web3 that we have. Uh, so, how is Web3 and Huddle position, right? So, we can see like all the layer ones like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Polkadot, right? They provide immutability as a service and everyone has their own way to do it. Like uh, uh, some have like smart contracts, uh, some have like better consensus, some have like good finality time. There's like every parameters you'll find every flavors of layer ones, right? But with layer ones, you can only build financial applications, right? If you want to build a social application, the primitives are not available on this layer to actually build those. What layer two provides is basically they scale the layer ones, right? So again, you can only build what primitives are available on the layer ones, so you can build financial application. But with this decentralized real-time communication uh, architecture or layer, you can have this uh, real-time audio video transfer in less than 100 millisecond, right? And this opens a lot of gates. So this opens uh, gates to build social applications uh, that we have. And from the Web2 world, we can see uh, the major applications that have the highest social uh, values are basically social in nature. It could be like Twitter, uh, it's Instagram, or previously it was Facebook, uh, and all those things. And they are, com even like if you see YouTube and other things, right? they're basically consumptions of this audio video either on a sync level or either on the async level. So anyway, uh, I believe like the, uh, conversation or communication would move into two direction, which is like synchronous communication and other is asynchronous communication. And as our internet penetrations uh, and speed increases, uh, I think 
the demand for real time communication would increase on those side and with new devices like uh, the i apple headsets or the sunglasses that are coming up uh, i think this technology like spatial computing this would be in demand in future uh, thank you guys uh, and uh, uh, i had a nice time if you have any question let me know <laughs>